Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com runs down the major markets. There was lots of volatility following the Fed's latest rate hike. Ross takes a look at the rising Canadian dollar, gold, and crude. Robert Campbell, publisher of the RealEstateTiming.com newsletter, examines the latest market trends in real estate and tells us where he believes the housing bubble is about to burst. John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, tells us little has been done to update the electrical grid to accommodate the push for electric vehicles. He's also worried about an economic collapse. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Introducing Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit Recyclico.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Always a pleasure, Jim. Ross, how did the uh, stock market shake out this week? <laughs> well, it did shake. Uh, <laughs> there was lots of volatility uh, with the... Uh, um, you know, the Fed here causing um, some uh, action in the middle of the week. Um, we had a little bit of an uptick uh, on uh, Wednesday, just as uh, the uh, Fed did announce their 75-point move. But um, after the commentary came out, um, markets got hit. Um, lots and lots of volatility. At the end of the week, uh, things are bouncing back again. But, you know, we've been looking for... This uh, choppy period um, from September on, um, and uh, the uh, you know we're we're sitting in a uh, uh, sort of this window where seasonality should be kicking in normally on the bullish side as you start into November, uh, but we've got the big rolling distribution top that we put in uh, in the last um, um, six to twelve months. So we got a lot of overhead here. So this market's uh, still uh, got to prove itself. Um, the uh, resistance level that we're looking at uh, back uh, on August the 4th, uh, it managed to uh, uptick through there and then break down. And it's got to get back above that. So I would say on the S&P, um, it's got to push back above the 3,800 level to be back in uh, positive position again. But um, overall, um, you know, this is sort of the, the classic of a bear market where you uh, uh, you get a grinding down and then you get the sharp rallies back up and then it happens all over again. You know, the, the Nikkei was a prime example in that uh, uh, 30 years ago uh, when uh, we went through, you know, years of bear markets and uh, everybody, got, everybody got excited on each one of the bounces and... Uh, that appears to be what's happening as far as the uh, U.S. markets. Uh, well, in general, most markets right now are concerned that um, shorten the rallies and um, no follow through. So, well, uh, we'll see if the seasonality gets in uh, as we uh, move towards the end of the year. What's happening on the currency front? Uh, big action there this week. Um, the at the tail end of the week, the employment numbers on the U.S. You got uh, two hundred and fifty thousand. A new job, the Canadian number, just uh, a blowout number, 108,000. Um, and so what you got is the uh, rolling over of this U.S. dollar. It's, it's pretty much got a, a triple top over the last six weeks or so. And uh, having trouble um, to uh, to do too much more on the upside. And in the Canadian dollar, you know, we mentioned this a few weeks ago, um, capitulation lows down at uh, the uh, 72 and a half level. Um, and uh, that was back in uh, the end of September. Uh, dollar went down and put in a marginally lower low uh, at uh, the uh, the end of October. 
and then turned higher. So there's a, a base in here uh, that looks like we call it a head and shoulders pattern. So you've got your first drive to a bottom, second marginally lower low, and then putting in a higher low, which is what happened this week. So that base uh, will give us some measurements now probably towards the 75 and a half cent level. And we're closed at 74 and change uh, as of the end of this week. Um, pretty good possibility that uh, you get a decent bounce in here. And, uh, you know, it's happening across the board. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at Canadian or the British Crown. Uh, it was uh, a decent week to, uh, or a decent way to finish off the week. The U.S. dollar index itself uh, had been um, uh, up into the uh, 113 level uh, here on um, Thursday, but uh, no follow through back down under 111. And um, it's, um, you know, um, we saw excesses uh, two months in a row uh, during September and October. And typically at that point, you'd look for a decent correction. And it looks as though it might be on the verge of that. But I think you have to take out sort of that 109.5 to think that uh, the U.S. dollar correction is really gaining some steam. What's the story on gold? Um, big week here. Uh, when we take a look at it, um, both the uh, gold and silver got hit uh, pretty hard uh, on uh, in the second half of the week, but uh, we ended up with a pretty uh, significant pattern here on the on the U.S. dollar or on the uh, gold market. It managed to put in a uh, lower weekly low and then close above the previous week's high. So that kind of an outside reversal. Uh, in gold, this is just the 11th time since 1975 when the Americans were once again allowed to own gold, and, it, and there was all that hype back then. Uh, but this is the 11th time that we've had an upside reversal such as this. And um, most of those uh, reversals end up with rallies that uh, will approach the 20 or 50-week moving average. So there's lots of potential. Um, two of them were significant moves. One, one was the one coming off the low at, uh, at $105 in 1975. Um, that ran to 420. Um, the next one like that, uh, ran from, uh, 400 up to 1900. So, uh, we had two big super rallies out of reversals like this. But um, the average is probably around, uh, the rally back to the, uh, the 50 week moving average. So that, that gives gold some decent potential. Um, the exciting one, though, has uh, been uh, overall the silver market and how well it's been holding in here. Uh, the uh, move we were uh, pointing out uh, that uh, there had been some oh, of the silver stocks that we looked at, uh, four of them had really stood out in, in the last month and a half, uh, having minor corrections and holding well. And um, they've uh, ended up uh, doing quite well. Uh, silver itself uh, closed at 286. Uh, this was uh, at 18 and a quarter uh, just a week and a half ago. So nice big reversal in silver. And um, the, uh, the good-looking silver stocks have uh, really gained uh, some uh, traction. And uh, look as though they've got uh, reasonable potential here. What's happening with crude? Uh, another one of those ones that uh, the tail end of the week uh, ended up just to uh, probably uh, look at it here. Uh, this has got to be the best week we've had in quite a while. Uh, started the week at uh, at 85 and closed off the week at 92 and a half. Um, decent looking consolidation there uh, under this uh, resistance level that we've been playing against. And um, pretty, I think it's got some decent potential. Uh, the oil stocks, uh, the big names, uh, the Occidentals, the Exxons, um, doing uh, exceptionally well here, sort of leading on the upside. Uh, on the Canadian, um, the uh, um, we're looking at uh, some pretty good action pretty much across the board. So uh, things like the XLE or the XEG uh, ETFs um, still... Uh, after having a bit of a pause here, have uh, come back to life, so they've probably got uh, decent potential. Ross, thank you so much for the update. Good to be with you, Jim. 
My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Robert Campbell next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Robert Campbell, author of Timing the Real Estate Market, and the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter. You can find him online at realestatetiming.com. He's speaking to us from beautiful, warm San Diego. Bob, welcome back to This Week in Money. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me. And, and when you say sunny California that we had, I, I have to confess that we had a, uh, it rained a day, a millionth of an inch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I guess that's your, your rainfall for the year then. <laughs> Almost. We get 15 inches of rain here. So that, so that's that. So the, um, um, it's great being back on the show. Bob, when will the next issue of the Campbell Real Estate Timing Letter come out? It's, it, it'll be published, uh, on or before November 15th. And I'm working on it right now. And it's, this is, um, I enjoy putting every one of them out. Uh, but this one is particularly um, uh, enjoyable for me because the the housing market in the United States has clearly turned. I, the, in the last uh, four months, I've been getting people ready for it. You know, I'm saying that you know what that that I don't know how close you guys want to play it to the top, but we're 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 right there right now. I mean, things were appreciating so rapidly at, at like. 20% a year, you know, I mean, all of a sudden, if it didn't turn in like six months, you, you could, um, and, and you sold, I mean, you could miss out on 10%, but those 10% profits, you know, lost profits could come dear if it turned on you before, and it has right now. So we're right in the early stages of a, of a turn in the market right now, and I'm showing some of my projections of how far the decline is going to be and why it's going to do that and, and all that stuff. So um, this is, uh, I'm really enjoying, you know, a little more than usual putting out this issue of my timing letter because most people don't have a clue what's going on with real estate. They don't. You know, I've been around real estate my whole life, and, and that's why, and I know, I, I can tell in an instant we're talking to somebody who knows what, who knows um, about real estate from a timing aspect and who doesn't. I mean, it's just so obvious, and most people don't. And the um, and, it's, and it doesn't take a Mensa IQ to understand it. You just have to know where to look. And I've been studying this thing for 30 years now, and I know exactly where to look. So, and most people don't have a clue. So that's that's how you can call the turns like this. So we're there right now, and it's um, now all you're going to be looking at is uh, everybody had 10 years worth of worth of magnificent gains, and now the six years are going to be um, ones of magnificent, equally magnificent losses. Does your book, Timing the Real Estate Market, cover times of rising interest rates? Yeah, it does, because interest rates are one of my, are one of my um, five key indicators that I use, that, that, that I focus on for timing markets. And interestingly, interest rates, however, are my least predictive indicator of the five indicators. And why I included interest rates was this. When all the other um, timing indicators were saying, you know, prices are likely to keep going higher, when, if, the, if the trend in, in interest rates turned from, like, up to down or started declining dramatically, that's like a shot of adrenaline into the market, Jim. And that's, that's, where, that's where you can really get fast appreciation. Like everything's, everything's a go green, you know, on the other four, and all of a sudden interest rates start coming down. It doesn't get any better than that. But, but, but real estate can go up during rising interest rates. So that, that it, it's not, it, it, it's not a, um, um, you can't look at interest rates, by, interest rates by themselves and time real estate market. This week, the Fed raised the bank rate by three quarters of a percent. What could this mean for real estate? It means it's 
bad news for real estate because, of course, because that means that means um, interest rate, mortgage rates are going to keep going up. Um, I, I think it was uh, just a week ago, mortgage rates in the United States just breached seven percent for the first time in twenty years. So they're up above seven percent, and they're going to keep going up. Interest rates are going to keep going up. Mortgage rates are going to keep going up. And I know everybody thinks all of a sudden that the, the Fed was um, Fed chairman was was really strong with their words on, on what they said when they when they um, during that during the during the Fed meeting when they said they um, when they announced to the public that they're raising rates three quarters of a percent and that. Jerome Powell, the Fed chairman, said, we're not going to stop, so don't count on it, you know? I mean, we're going to keep raising rates. Of course, he said, oh, we may slow the raise hikes um, a little bit, you know, just so the markets wouldn't go completely berserk. I mean, and, you know, they only fell 500 points that day, and if he said, if he didn't make that last statement, they probably would have fell 1,000 points. So they're making statements like that to help... Uh, calm everybody's nerves, but there's no question about it. The Fed's going to keep raising interest rates. Mortgage rates are going to go up. They they have to, they have to kill inflation. Everybody, there is no choice because inflation, even though it hurts the poor more than it hurts the rich, it hurts everybody. And pretty soon you get inflation back to where it is. You let inflation let inflation run where people can't even afford food. They can't even even afford run, rent. Uh, rent. Civil unrest could break out, and people it, it could just devastate people financially. And if you allow that to happen, I mean the economy is going to go right in the tank and stay in the tank. So they've got to stop it. They have to stop it, and they are going to stop it. They're not going to pivot. They're not going to pivot at all with with inflation at eight percent. Right now, and and the Fed funds rate is at four. They got to get that Fed funds rate above eight percent, above eight percent. And right now, mortgage rates here in the United States, let's just call them seven, even though they're just a little above. Historically, if you look at how how mortgage rates track with inflation, that um, mortgage rates carry a three percentage point spread over the rate of inflation. Thus, if inflation is eight percent. Mortgages should be 11%, not 7%. So we got a long ways to go. So real estate's going to get creamed. I mean, and what's, what's it most interesting about this is they had to put the brakes on and raise interest rates, not during a period where, where real estate was, um, you know, just kind of doing average going up stuff, that we were at a, you know, all-time peak where prices were appreciating at 20% a year. Now we're slamming on the brakes. So all those people that bought houses in the last two years, the last two years, they're going to get creamed from an equity standpoint. Creamed. There's going to be blood in the street. And people go, oh, yeah, but they got a 3% interest rate. As long as they hold on, you know, they won't lose their house. Yeah, they won't lose their house if they don't lose their job or take, or take a, um, a, a cut in their income or some other life event hits them that is, is all too common. But if, but if all of a sudden you you paid uh, uh, the average price home in California cost nine hundred grand, and if you bought that and if you bought that home with a three percent interest rate and the three percent interest rate and all of a sudden uh, mortgage rate and rates go to like seven eight nine let's just say they go to ten, you know how much you're gonna you know how much you're gonna sell that house for that if you're forced to put it on the market for one reason or another about five hundred and fifty thousand because you know that 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 nine hundred thousand dollar home. At three and a half percent, everybody can afford a big mortgage. Everybody can afford it. Now, it, now it, let's just say rates go to ten. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Now you've cut down the number of people who can afford that. That that mortgage probably falls by about seventy percent, and therefore there goes demand. And if you want, if you have to sell your house, if you want to sell your house, let's say you get a job transfer. You know, people die too. You know, let, let's say one of us baby boomers dies. And all of a sudden, the kids get the house. You know what the kids are going to do with the house, Jim? You think they're going to turn it into a rental, or you think they're going to sell it so they can divide up the money and do whatever they want with it? So if you're in a bad interest rate environment, that that million x once million dollar house is going to sell for five fifty. So don't think it doesn't have consequences. Everything's everything's connected to everything. One thing leads to another. 
And that's why, you know, it, it's really wishful thinking to say like, oh, you're safe, you know, you, you know, you, you're gonna be, you, you're gonna be loving life having a, having a 3% mortgage for the rest of your life. Uh, yeah, only if you never have to sell the house and nothing bad ever happens to you, which, what, which isn't the case. How long does it take for interest rate rises to be felt in the housing market? For example, the latest hike by the Fed, three quarters of a percent. How long will that take to affect housing prices? Well, I would say that the lag time on that is, is, is fairly small, like three months or so. Um, because all of a sudden, because people keep, you know, they look at different ways to, to buy real estate, and then they come to the conclusion, wow, you know, the, um, uh, that you know that that nine hundred thousand dollar house in San Diego. I mean, now all of a sudden the interest rate's not three; it's seven. It's seven, and you know, you know, when my friend bought it, you know, four years ago, it was forty percent lower. Now I need an extra, you know, um, a sixty five thousand dollars in a down payment to, to buy the thing. And, and how many people have sixty five thousand dollars laying around? Extra? They don't. But it, it, it doesn't take that long. There, there is a lag, but it doesn't take that long. I would say if I just had that best guess, you know, three to four months, maybe six at the, at the outset. What's the latest on the U.S. housing markets and especially California? Well, California, the housing market has turned both nationally and in California. California has the weakest housing market in the, in the country right now. And not by much, but we still have the, we still have the, uh, it, it, it's the worst market. And interestingly, the strongest state in the United States housing market is Florida. You know, for Tampa, Miami, they're still, they're still doing fairly well relative to California. California housing prices in the three major cities, San Diego, San Francisco is the worst market. They've dropped about 10% off the peak. And, and, and prices peaked in California in April of 20, 2022. That, that was, that was peak price. And so San Francisco's down about 10%, San Diego's maybe down 5%, and LA's maybe down 6 or 7. In, in, um, in contrast, you look at Miami and Tampa, they're still, their prices are, um, still, uh, near the peak. In fact, they're still climbing. So there are some exceptions. But, but don't let the exceptions influence your decision making that that because the 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 exceptions don't general um negate the general rule and housing's coming down and so this i mean if you lived in florida or florida somewhere this and and, and you own investment property and you said hey i don't want to take this hit going forward you know i, I don't want to sit there and watch my money you know burn up in flames my equity burn up in flames now would be a perfect time to sell a number of cities in San Francisco comes to mind have significant homeless populations in tent cities. Is this affecting the price of homes and volume of sales? Absolutely. Florida. Florida. In fact, the, the, the exodus out of San Francisco is, is significant. In fact, interestingly, the, the, the city of San Francisco has put up billboards. Please don't leave San, San Francisco. And they're trying, to, they're trying to beg people to stay, but people don't want to stay there anymore. San Francisco used to be a beautiful place. And now that, when I, I gave a speech to, back in January up in the Bay Area, in the North Bay Area, in, uh, Marin, Marin County, and, um, I brought my bride up with me and I said, you know, we'd normally stay up there two or three days and, and look around because San Francisco's fun. You know, it's such a small area. You could walk around the city, the financial district and go from, you know, the, um, uh, one side of the city to the other and both sides there's, there's water. And I said, is, is that, do you think we should go into San Francisco? And uh, is it safe to go in there for a day? And two people that I know said, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. It's just, it, it, it's, it's crime-ridden. There's, there's, there's dog shit everywhere. And, and, there's, and there's homeless people sleeping in it. So it's not, it's not the same place it was 10 years ago. We're hearing the Canadian real estate markets topped in February. When did the U.S. real estate markets top? U.S. nationally, it, parked, it, it popped probably um, June of this year. California in, in April. California is leading the way, but but it's over there. It's it's over too, so it's more recent. So so in other words, San Francisco that peaked out in February. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yep. So so you guys are leading the way. You guys, you know what? I've just scratched my head in amazement that because I know markets. 
I know trance. You guys have been straight up in the air for like the last 30 years. I go, how can you do it? How can it keep this kind of momentum without, you know, a correction of any significance? And and you're probably going to get it now. Uh, the um, because that your central bank is cranking up rates too. What's the inflation rate in Canada right now, Jim? Eight percent. Yep, same as here in the U.S. You guys well, well, no of course, I'm either. I'm I'm not using the official government numbers. They say six point seven, but they don't put in housing or fuel. Okay, it, 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 or or yeah, if you include everything, what's the inflation rate? Well, at least twelve. Yeah. Wow. That, is that a government report? And, and, the, and at least here in the U.S., you can add at least three or four percentage points to whatever the government reports. Last year, I got a 5.9% increase in my Social Security benefit. You know, COLA, um, cost of living, cost of living increase. Well, when you're on Medicare, that you get part part of it for free, and then you have to pay for Part B, and plus I have supplemental insurance and all that stuff, and that all gets taken out of your Social Security payment. So in other words, with all this inflation that we're having, net net, after I had my medical deductions taken out, I think I was up a hundred dollars a month. You know what a hundred dollars a month buys nowadays? A bag of groceries. So I mean, it's just a joke. That and, and that just shows, just goes to show you that you know how people are getting hurt. Yeah, yeah. Can we afford that? Yes, we're fortunate enough to afford that. I mean, are we gonna? Are we watching our spending? Yeah, we've always watched our spending. That's why we have some money. But I mean, the average guy, the average guy in the street, that you know, he can't afford that. And gas prices here in California are the highest in the country. Highest in the country. I think we're at least a dollar a gallon um, more than who's ever in second place. So you know, living in California, not only housing. But in all other aspects of it is very expensive. California has the second highest cost of living in the, of all 50 states in the United States. You know what's number one? Hawaii. <laughs> Hawaii. And it's above us by a lot, like 20%. It costs a lot of money to live in, in Hawaii. But so those are two states that you better have some dough if you're going to live there because it costs a lot to live there. Uh, some states apparently are flying homeless people to Hawaii. You don't need more homeless people in Hawaii. If you've ever been to Hawaii, and I've been there, that's my second favorite place in the world after San Diego, after Southern California, that the poverty level in Hawaii is, is one of the highest in the countries, even though the cost of living is so high. All those Hawaiians that own homes, you know where they got those homes? Their parents owned them. And you know who owned it before the parents owned them? The parents of the parents owned them. It's all hand-me-down stuff. Hawaiians as a group are very, very poor people, you know, because they're, they're, they're not like mainland people where they're chasing dollars. You know, I love the Hawaiian people, just like I love Hawaiian, uh, Italian people, but m- making money isn't the most important thing to them. And Hawaiians, if you spend any time over there, everything's just, uh, all they want to do is get up in the morning, smoke pot, and be with their friends, and go out and surf. I mean, that's just, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it, that's just their lifestyle. They're just not motivated by money, and they're very, very poor. So, I mean, the, um, the, um, it, it's just interesting that, you know, that, that most people would be surprised to know that until you've spent time over there. Does inflation tend to put a floor under housing prices for the short to medium term? Yeah, it can. Interestingly, because if you look, if you look back at the, the great inflation of the 1970s, that housing prices in the United States, and, and here's the kind of floor. Housing prices in the United States kind of held their own. You know, like inflation went up, went up 6% a year, housing went up 6% a year. So net net, you didn't gain any money, you didn't lose any money. Here in California, it was an exception. They kept pace with inflation all up until the last two years where, where, where the Fed raised interest rates to like, you know, Volcker raised interest rates to 18 to 20 percent to, 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 to stop the inflation. And then California housing in the next two to three years um, went down uh, 20 to 25 percent in real terms, real terms. In other words, they, that inflation was running off at, at 13 to 15 percent. Your house didn't drop in value, but at the end of the year, you lost 15 percent of your, that, that equity you had in your home would buy 15 percent less than it did the year before. So you just lost 15, 15 percent of your money. But 
real estate can hold its own during those period of times. But the, the, it, it's interesting with real estate, too, during inflations, that like rental properties, you know, rents can keep going up, but also the cost of maintaining those rental properties can keep going up. Because if you look back at what happened during the 19, early 1920s, during the Weimar uh, hyperinflation, the rental property, you know, people had to have a place to live. And so what they had to do, they said, you can't raise your rents. And, and rental properties got smashed because they say you can't raise your rent because people can't afford to live there anymore. So you have to keep them the same. Okay. And, and you know, you know, the, 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 the rich people were, were going to carry the, the inflationary burden. Here's the problem. Prior to the inflation, let's say a water heater. People stopped maintaining their property, Jim. Because prior to the inflation, let's say a water heater went out. And let's say, for example, it would cost you a thousand dollars, you know, in um, 1919. Then the hyperinflation hit, and the water heater goes out. It didn't cost you a thousand dollars anymore. It cost you thirty thousand dollars to replace the water heater, and nobody can afford to do that because you can't get any more money in rent. So real estate tanked too. So a lot of things happen happen um, during inflations where people try to they start price fixing. You can't raise your rent. You can't do this. It's not saying that the cost of maintaining, the, the, you know, they're not going to stop the cost of maintenance of that house from going up. So homeowners, you know, property owners could get smashed during those periods. So there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty as 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 to how real estate will fare during a um, during a uh, during these high inflation. Like right now here in the United States, um, Joe Biden, he's putting the inflation on the backs of the oil companies. Say, you guys should bear the price of this, which is total BS. But everybody's going to blame somebody else, and that's what they do. So what's going to happen is the oil companies are going to stop investing in, 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 in new oil fields. Supply is, going to, supply is going to go nowhere but down. And then after this, after this um, go green nonsense, you know, gains full extreme, and we're, and we're five years down the road, and they go, guess what? Renewable energy isn't even going to come close to providing the energy we need to, to effectively run a country, and now we need oil again. There's not going to be any oil. That's why I think oil is going to go to two, three hundred bucks again. At some point in the future, real oil is going to go to two to three hundred bucks a barrel. That's why I think energy, you know, especially oil, is going to be a good investment during the next five years. Because there's, Nobody's investing in it. Nobody's going to keep investing in an industry, in research and development, finding new oil fields, if the government's going to try to shut you down, if the government's going to try to put you out of business. So eventually, eventually, and maybe sooner rather than later, oil's going to be scarce, very scarce relative to the demand. And, you know, I'm the economist. You know, it's all about supply and demand. Oil prices are going to soar. What has to be? That, that's my view, just based on supply and demand, and and knowing what these, knowing what the politicians are trying to do nowadays. Shut down fossil fuel. What has to be done to stop inflation? You have to raise interest rates. You have, you have, you, you have to you have to um, decrease demand, and that's the way to do it. You know, let, let, let's say there's a hundred houses. Um, uh, that, let's say there's a hundred people in the United States, hundred people in a given area. And interest rates are five percent. Okay, and let's say those hundred people, there's a demand for fifty ho- fifty homes. Raise interest rates, you know, double them. It goes from fifty down to twenty, then down to ten, you know, then down to five, where nobody can afford a home, and the people that want to sell them, the, o- the only recourse they have to sell their home is drop their price, so that people can afford to buy that home with a ten percent mortgage or a fifteen percent mortgage. That, back in 1981. Here in the United States, mortgages got to 18% a year. 18! Who can afford that? You can't afford that. That's a, and so that, that's, and, and, and that's, and that'll break that, that'll break the, uh, demand for housing. Prices will come down. Prices will come down. And, um, if, if you want to sell, they, they have to come down. If nobody on your street, you know, ever sells their home, you know, then you can say, my, the price of my home didn't drop. Yeah, but the next door neighbor, for some reason, you know, he gets divorced or gets sick or loses his job and he has to sell his home. Everybody's home was worth a million bucks at three percent. Now at now at at eight percent mortgage, it's not worth a million bucks anymore. It's worth seven hundred thousand. You just lost three hundred thousand dollars on your home without doing a thing because the prices are always set at the margin. The last the last trade, the last sale is what controls. And so there you are. 
Now, everybody's house on the block just went from a million dollars to 700,000 bucks in 30 days. And that's what'll happen. And now the next guy that's going to sell his home going, well, I won't, you know, I'm not going to give my house away. You know, I want to sell it, but I still want to, I might drop a little, I might drop to 950. Good luck. It's not going to sell. Not going to sell. So that's the way markets work. That's the interesting thing about markets. They're driven by the collective actions of human beings and the last, the last trade, the last price that, that was, that, that a, a piece of real estate or a stock or, uh, an ounce of gold traded for, that's, that's the new market right there. Do you expect the homes for sale inventory to grow? Yes, I do. In fact, what, we have a real interesting situation here in the United States that, as far as I know, I've never seen before. Because demand, uh, home sales, existing home sales in the United States are down, on average, about 30%. Yet prices, in California, they're down 30%. Yet prices are only down, let's just say, 5%. Normally, they'd be down a lot more than that. So what explains that? The inventory of homes on the market has slowed along with the demand on homes. So, so let's just, theoretically, let's, let, let's look at this. So there's still an equilibrium. If you have 100 homes on the market, if you have 100 buyers and there's 100 homes on the market, that's an equilibrium price. You can find an equilibrium price. So let's say demand falls 50% to 50. So there's only 50 buyers. Okay, if you have 100 homes on the market, prices would crash. But if the inventory of homes on the market sell to 50 to be, to be in um, alignment with demand, the price of homes wouldn't have to fall at all. See, a lot of people are holding off saying that they think this interest rate, this interest rate hike is going to be temporary, rates are going to come screaming back down, and everything's going to be back to normal. They're going to be in for a rude awakening. So one way or another, you know, I think the average home in the United States is, is um, people – People relocate from, from the home they're in to some other place for whatever reason every seven to eight years. So during the next, people are going to be moving they're, they're, they, and where they have to sell their house, you know, for one reason or another. And, um, and so all of a sudden now they're going to be in a brand new world of higher interest rates, higher down payments. And if we go into a recession, Jim, and this is really interesting, guys. The whole thing's interesting, but I find this really fascinating. The unemployment rate in, in the United States right now is like 3.5%, which is like all-time record lows or close to it. You know what that allows the, the Federal Reserve Board to do? Keep cranking on interest rates. Because the, the, thing the, the thing the Fed's afraid of most is by crashing the housing market at, in a period of high unemployment. With, with, with employment, you know, the employment field um, – business as, as, as strong as it is, they can keep cranking up interest rates, kill inflation, and before employment's going to go crazy. So that's what's going to give them the, the, the opportunity to keep cranking. It's when you see unemployment up around 10%, which happens during recessions. I think during the, during the, the 08, 09 recession in the United States, I think unemployment got to, um, uh, what was it, 10 or, 10 or 12%. Somewhere in there. And other periods of time, it's gotten to 10 or 12%. During, during the 1930s in the United States, unemployment got to 25%. So you can't raise interest rates into, into, uh, um, the, into an economy that has 10% unemployment. Oh, that's just like, that, 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 you might as well just shoot yourself in the head. But they can keep raising interest rates as long as unemployment is, is, is still, is still low. And until that gets bad, then maybe they'll back off. So I don't think there's any doubt that the Fed's going to keep is, is, is going to is, is going to keep hiking and hiking and hiking. They've got to stop this inflation. They have. I mean, it, it's like it's like okay, like pick your poison, right? Lower asset values or raging inflation. You can't have both. And so they're, they're going to go with the uh, they're going to go with the um, the higher rates. They got to stop inflation. And, you know, and I was just looking at Europe yesterday. I think, I think there's 19, are there 19 countries in, in the Eurozone? Something like that, right? Sure. The, uh, I'm the, not sure. The inflation rate across all 19 countries is 11%. Those guys are in such bad shape that, that the, we've got our Fed funds rate, our short term interest rate up to 4%. And we only have 8% inflation. Europe is 11 average and, the, and, and their short term interest rate is still 1.5%. Those guys are just going to get slaughtered. Either way, either way, 
you know, I mean, that, that, that you, you think inflation's bad here in the, in the United States or Canada. The United States, you know, I, I think the Canada, you go over to Europe and it's worse. I think it's Latvia. I don't even know where Latvia is. I think that, that's at the high, it's in the Eurozone. Their inflation is 22%. That that just devastates a country, guys. Devastating. And they still have their short term interest rates at one and a half. That that that's insane. That you know, that, that they choose to keep it that low. But they but they're they're so over leveraged and in debt. Any any incremental increase, you know, just puts another nail in their coffin. So I don't know what's gonna happen to Europe. I'm just I'm glad I'm not living there. Well, Latvia is in northern Europe between Estonia and Lithuania and uh, north of Poland, that area. Right, okay. Yeah. And, and, and those two countries, other countries you yeah. mentioned, the, the inflation rate up there is almost equally as high. The, the country, uh, of all the Eurozone countries, the, the, the lowest inflation, Jim, is in France at 7%. 7%. I, I, I don't know. What's it in? Germany's 11. I think England's 11 or 12. In, in Germany... After the hyperinflation of the 1920s, Germany has always been the most conservative country in Europe for decades and decades and decades because they're so afraid of, of hyperinflating the economy, like happened in the early 20s, that, that they've, they've, they've avoided that at all costs. Even, you know, so, I mean, has property appreciated in Germany, like in other places? Not even close. Not even close. But they kept inflation at bay. Now Germany's at 11 or 12 percent. That's insane. Those people over there must be going crazy. That's not, that's not the way they roll. So we're going to see what happens over there. I mean, they got some, they got some bad times ahead of them. In Canada, we're hearing that Vancouver and Toronto are considered to be bubble real estate markets. Where are the bubble markets in the U.S.? Well, let's say the most extreme valuation. I would put them, I, 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 here are the, here are the four cities that come to mind. And there were the four cities that were in the, that were most overvalued during the, um, during the, at, at 2006. One, number one would be Las Vegas. Number two would be Phoenix. Number three would be Miami. Number four, what would number four be? I don't know. What, those are the top three right there. I, cause, cause I've looked at a chart. Those guys are gonna get, those guys are gonna get their heads handed to them. It's just, cause they're, I mean, what, there's nothing that I, what's ideal about Phoenix, right? It's not on the coast. The most expensive real estate is typically on the coast, you know, by a, by a wide margin. People have flo- people have flocked to Phoenix because it's an affordable place to live. Well, it's not so affordable anymore. So Phoenix is gonna get hit hard. Vegas is gonna get hit hard. I mean, how do you have high, high, Housing costs in an area where the vast majority of your workforce works for casinos. You think casino workers make a lot of money? No, they don't. They don't. They're unskilled. You know, they, they maybe make, you know, like, I don't know, thirty, forty, forty-five thousand dollars a year. But you can't afford a, you know, a four hundred thousand dollar house if you make thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Yeah, you can if the interest rate's two and a half percent. But interest rates go to 7%, whoa, now reality smacks you in the face. Now your $400,000 house is worth two fifty, and that's what's going to happen. Do you think uh, Las Vegas, Miami, and Phoenix will see crashes like they did in 2008, 2009? It, 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 it's very possible, and I do expect that. Because if you look at charts, if you look at charts, and what, what I do, everybody, is I study charts. Because the best way to predict, I'm always looking ahead. I'm always thinking ahead, not only with my, with my timing indicators, but with a, a study of the past to determine what's going to happen in the future. And if you were to go back, like, like let's say 40 or 50 years in Las Vegas, and looked at how housing prices performed over, you know, over those last 40 years, um, and the boom and bust cycles, and, and you take inflation out of it, you'll see they always come back, to, they always revert to some long-term mean that is significantly below where it is right now. That's the nature of things. That's what these markets do. You have to look at past charts and say, wow, look what happened. Because real estate is cyclical. It's cyclical in every country in the world except Canada. <laughs> I keep scratching my head. I keep going, I don't know how you guys do it. It is. It's very cyclical business, uh, industry. So the um, but so you look back and you go, 
wow. It was sitting here at these levels. Then all of a sudden, during 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 the, during the real estate boom, um, uh, during you know from from nineteen right nineteen ninety five to two thousand and six, that ten year boom, housing prices went up seventy percent. Guess what? You know how much they came down during the during the bust? Seventy percent. Now they're back up seventy percent again, and they came back down to a to a a mean trend line. A mean trend line, and everything reverts back, tends to revert back to normal. That, that's one of the only economic laws that has any value. And I watched that very closely. And now they're way above it, and they're going to come screaming down. And the only way they're not going to come screaming down is that if this time it's different. And occasionally that holds true, guys. But if you're betting on this time it's going to be different throughout your lifetime, you're going to lose all your money. What restarts housing markets after they collapse? Low prices. Low prices, like California housing market during the uh, from d- after the ab- after the boom and they peaked in 2006, and at the bottom in 2012, they were 53 percent lower than they were at the peak, Jim. 53 percent, and that's what cranks it up. All of a sudden, something people go, "Wow!" They, they get because housing prices can fluctuate a hell of a lot more than incomes are going to fluctuate. I mean, that just goes without saying, right? Your income's not going to drop 55%. I mean, if it does, you're homeless, eating out of garbage cans. So, I mean, you're not, you're not a prospective home buyer by any means. So prices drop way down. And all of a sudden, you get to be a hard economic times, like we were, um, like, like we, um, like we were in 08, 09, when I think that, um, unemployment got up to, you know, over 10%. All of a sudden, now interest rates come way down. But there's an interesting difference. No two cycles are exactly the same, everybody. There's always a twist. When housing market in California fell, um, you know, 55%, 53% from from 06 to, uh, to to 2012, what was inflation? What was it, 3 or 4%? Now it's double that. So that's a whole new thing in there. So interest rates may not come down. If it, unless they kill inflation, interest rates are not coming down. They're not coming down. So, I mean, that's a whole new twist that, you know, on this cycle. So that, that's, that's what makes life so interesting. No, you know, no two events are ever identical, but they do, as, as a past economist say, you know, they may, they may not be exact, but they rhyme. And yes, they rhyme. But this, this time, what, what's the wild card this time? It's inflation. What's gonna, how are things gonna fare out with inflation? Another thing, everybody, is this. It's the debt. United States right now is, has 30, owes 31 trillion dollars of national debt. That's up from like 20 trillion, like, let's say, like five years ago. That's how fast, that what they're doing is they're, they're printing so much money and going into so much debt to keep the, keep the wheels on the economy here in the United States. Now we have all this debt. And the average maturity, I understand, of, of, of debt is like five or six years. So every year, something like, you know, 20% of the debt rolls over. So some of that debt that you had on the books at 3%, all of a sudden, you roll it over today, it's not going to be 3%, it's going to be 5%. The next year, it may be 6%. So up goes your debt servicing. Like, I think it was three, maybe maybe five years ago, that the, the total um, 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 interest on the national debt was something like, I think it was like $500 billion. Let's say round about $450, $500. Today it's $750. It's going to get to be a trillion dollars. And there's no, the only way that the government can afford to service the debt, unless they just decide to default on it, is, is to um, raise, is raise interest rates, print more money up, print more money up to cover the debt servicing. Because we're short already. Now they've got to print more money. So it's like dumping gasoline on a burning fire. That, that's what makes it so fascinating. Are banks likely to make it tougher to get mortgages? Oh, yeah. They'll tighten up dramatically when, when, when rates stop, you know, when rates uh, start increasing. Because they know that all of a sudden they're, they're going to start getting, um, um, uh, they're going to have to start foreclosing on more homes. They're going to start getting more REOs back. You know, and, and so, the, you know, the, they're going to start seeing that, you know, that cycle turn too. So obviously, they have to become more conservative. Also, there's a thing called a lot of people borrow against their home to, to live. Like, okay, let, let's say your home was worth $500,000, um, $500,000 10 years ago, and today it's worth a million dollars. The, um, and, and people need money. They'll borrow against their home, you know, to, um, um, 
you know, so they can live, to, you know, to, to service their living standards. Once you start getting into a down market, those those home equity cash out loans, the banks just say that the banks have a new policy, and it's a two letter word that starts with the letter N. No, and so that that equity is not available to you. So if all of a sudden you get into a jam where you don't have any money, you lost your job, or you can't afford food, or who knows what else, you know? Um, who knows what else? You know, you can't afford to send your kids to college if that's still on the books. You can't borrow against your house. You're going to have to sell your house. And all of a sudden, so these people aren't going to be able to borrow against it. And they, let's say they can't afford their house. Property values have cranked up. The, you know, the, the insurance rates have, have cranked up. Everything is more expensive. Maintaining their homes cracked up. So the only way they can get away from it, Jim, is to sell their home. Here comes inventory. There's lots of different ways that inventory can increase. And, and you know what? And they can happen across the board during, during, um, um, down economic times like recession. And I don't see how there's any way in the world that we're going to avoid recession. There isn't any way. It's going to happen. And so, you know, the, people are going to get in trouble. People are going to get in trouble. And if you look back at history, guys, and I'm a real history buff, because I like to say, where were we? Are we that much rich? Are we that rich today? And or how rich are we today? The, the average American has a net worth, adult American, has a, has a net worth, like in, let's say my, let's say age group like, um, 60 and above. His net worth is about $250,000. $250. And most of that's in the equity in his home. So don't think that everybody that owns a home in California, let's say your home's worth $900,000 on average, on average, that everybody's a millionaire. They're not. They're, they're mortgaged up to their eyeballs most of the time. Yeah, they made some easy money, easy money during the good times they just went through. But now when the bad times hit, most of those people don't know how to correctly manage downside risk. And they let the market do that for them. And that's where the trouble starts. And they, most people aren't proactive like that. Because, you know, most people aren't that sophisticated. All of a sudden you're in a boom market and your house doubles in price. In the last 10 years, you feel rich and you feel entitled. That's human nature. Then the bad times hit. Nobody's reactive going, well, I need to know how to protect my equity. You know, I need to do something. Yeah, they don't normally do something until it's too late, until it's too late. And the, 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 the I'm a real estate timer, and I'm not afraid to tell people that I'm really good at what I do. That's one area of expertise I'm, I'm, I, I excel at. Most people's timing, you know, here's the timing strategy most people use for real estate. They buy it like rental property. They buy it when they have the money, which is usually during good economic times, and then they sell it when they need the money, which is during bad economic times. And that's why the average individual doesn't get ahead, Jim. That's their timing strategy. It's, it's no more. It's no more sophisticated than that. And you're not going to get ahead in life um, with that strategy. When do you think will be the time to start looking at buying real estate? I think here in California, based on past cycles, that for about the past 30, 40 years, uh, the cycles with slight variation has been six years up, six years down, six years up, six years down. So if we call 2022 the peak, which it is, I think the market's going to hit bottom in 2028. It's going to be a long, slow downtrend, guys, and you just have to be patient. Just wait for that. When you have to have cash to take advantage of the bargains when they're available. You know, you, you know, you just can't say, well, oh, gee, you know, all of a sudden, you know, my house fell 55% in value um, um, along with rental property. I'm going to buy rental property at the bottom. With what? You have no money. You have no cash. All your cash is stuck in your rental property that, you know, that your equity is zero now. So you got to, you got to make aggressive moves like that, guys. I know you have to pay taxes and all that kind of stuff. But if you, but if you look at the advantages, you know, net, 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 the advantages of selling high, paying your taxes, and, and then wait to buy when the, when the, when prices are low again, net, net, it's to your advantage to do that. And if you go through life where everything's a net positive, um, I don't have to worry about you. I know you're gonna, I know you're gonna do fine. But the, you know, there's, there's always consequences, paying taxes, and especially paying taxes here in California. We have the highest state taxes I in the country, and I think they're 15%, and we don't even have capital gains. So it, the, no, it's, all based, it's all ordinary income. 
So if, so if you made $500,000 on your house in California, the state tax alone is going to cost you 150000 Now you put the, now you put capital gains on it from a federal basis. I don't know what that is. Let's just say it's, it's 30% or something like that. There's another 30 after 500 after 500 What's 30? That's 3000 plus the 15. Now you net net you've made 50,000 bucks after taxes, after taxes. So it's, it's not easy getting ahead today in life. You know, either that or you just write it down and you got no money or you lose it to foreclosure for some reason. So I like to tell everybody, nothing good in life comes easy, guys. Nothing. You have to be good at what you do. You have to be strategic. You have to find your ways around it of doing things. But my favorite strategy for making money in real estate, because I come from the real estate field, uh, um, uh, construction and development, so I know how to build a home. And I know how to use my hands. I can, I can build a home, you know, if I had to, is to buy low, like, like, let's say you buy your own single family home. Buy it low. Move into it. Convert it into your own single family home. Add value. Pimp it out. Make it, make it, make it worth more money with, with improvements. And, and to do that, you know, you have to live into a, a fairly affluent area because if you're, if you're living in the hood and you over improve your house, I mean, that's just like watching your money burn up. And ride the cycle up and then sell it at the peak and, and move back into your old home. I know that it, it, that's, that's not what they're going to teach you in college or anything like this, but the, based on my 70 years of experience in real estate, that's probably the best way to get ahead, that you're going to get ahead in real estate. Because the, the taxes, the taxes can be enormous nowadays. Either that or you, you can always move out of California. I mean, you can move to Texas or Florida. I don't think they have any income tax. So th- there you'd save 150 grand right off the top. And that's a lot of money. So instead of having 50 left over, now you're going to have 200. I, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, let, let's say you make $200,000 net every 10 years and you do that for, for, for 50 years. Now you got a million bucks. That's about $800,000 more than the average guy has. So, you know, th- so you're doing fine, you know. No, nobody's going to feel sorry for you. So it it, it it takes aggressive and active decision-making to do that kind of stuff, guys. Is quality food getting tougher to obtain due to soaring food costs? I don't know that it's tougher to obtain because I, um, I haven't shopped for food in 10 years, 12 years, the, um, because uh, my wife does all that. But I'll tell you something. We eat very healthy, and we eat things like olive oil. Olive oil is like coconut oil. It's expensive because it, it's some kind of a, a healthy oil versus like canola, like seed oil. You know, olive oil cost, can cost you $15 a quart, where you can get cheaper canola oil for like $5. The difference health-wise is enormous. The last time, and, and we buy it when, when we stock up on that stuff, especially now during these inflationary times. But my wife tells me in the last 12 months, canola oil has gone from $15 a quart to 25 That's like a 40% increase, guys. And every, and, 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 and because that's quality food. If you want to eat well, I mean, has the price of rice and beans gone up much? I don't know. It sure hasn't gone up 40%, I'll tell you that. So to eat healthy, it's definitely going to cost you money. Definitely. But is, is that a good investment? There's no better investment than taking care of your health. It's the number one investment you can make in your life. It's not real estate. It's not stocks. It's not gold. Any of that. It's taking care of your health. So you do what you have to do. You got to eat well. You got to work out. And, you know, and, and that's, and that's how you maintain your health. And, and so, but, but, so, so there's that, that you can let everything else go. Do you need a new car this year? No. Work on your health. You know, I just hired a trainer. I just hired a trainer and, and I hired a trainer for my wife and I. So we work out once a week with a trainer that just kicks our butt. And that's, and, and that's what I told him to do. I said, if you don't kick our butt, I'm going to hire some, I'm going to fire you and hire somebody that will. And trainers aren't cheap. But a friend of mine told me the other day, I've always been a saver, guys. One of the reasons I'm comfortable financially is every buck I've ever made, I've always saved 15% of it and knew how to invest it. So, you know, fast forward that from the time you're a teenager starting to, starting to make a few bucks to the time you are today and I'm still gainfully employed and still a saver, you know, that um, um, running out of money isn't my biggest worry by any means. 
but being unhealthy is. So a friend of mine told me, he said, Bob, he goes, I know you've, I know you've always been a saver, and I know you like being comfortable financially. And he said, but don't be afraid to spend some of your money. He said, I said, he said, because you know how much of that money you're going to take to the grave with you? And that was like a light bulb that went off in my head, Jim. <laughs> I said, you are so right. So what are we spending it on, mostly? We're spending it on health and good food, trainers, good food. We spent 25 bucks on cord for canola oil. That's expensive. And we go through that like crazy. Everything we do, put, we, you know, we, we, when you cook anything in oil, it's canola oil. I mean, olive oil. I'm sorry, olive oil. In our salads, olive oil. So, I mean, we go through that, that olive oil like crazy. But it's worth it, guys. It's worth it. Confucius said, whenever he lived, like a million years ago or something, he said, a rich man wants a hundred things. A man in poor health, only one. So you got to take, that's our highest priority every day. Every day that I work out. Every single day. I don't miss a day. I bet maybe you miss one day a month. That's it. Because that, that's, when I get up in the morning, I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Am I going to go to the gym? Am I going to go do sprints? Am I, am I going to go take a five mile walk up and down the, up and down the, the steep slopes in the canyon, which is good for you? Um, am, wh- which one of those things am I doing today? Because I do all of them. But it's just like, that's the first rule. That's, that's the first rule with me. You know, taking care of my health is like, is, is like oxygen to me. I can't do without it. And that's why I'm super healthy and full of energy, you know, for 75 years old. People can't believe I have this much energy and I'm in this kind of shape when I'm 75 because I've taken care of my health my whole life. So I'm living proof. And if I can do it, you can do it. Yeah, Bob, it's great. Uh, you have a photo that you took just a week ago. It's on the graphic with our broadcast. You don't look 75. How do you feel? I feel, you know what I feel like? Because I work out with the gym, my favorite kids. I, I feel like I'm in my 20s or 30s. I do. A lot of it's attitude. And, and a lot of it's attitude because of this, that I can do things. I can do some of the same physical things that all these kids can do. I can do burpees. I can do sprints. I can do all, I can run up hills and things like that. And most people think, how do you do that? Well, you can do more than you think you can do. And I do it. I just push. I push all the time. Now, I'm sure I can't run as fast today as I can when, um, you know, I was in my 20s, and you and I were talking about it before this interview, that, you know, my thing was speed. My thing was speed. So I can always go fast. I like to run fast, but I don't like to run long distances. I can't run fast anymore. I never could run long, run long distances. I don't even care for it. But so, you know, like four miles is enough for me. But so that I can't run as fast, but I push everything I do to a limit. And I'll tell you guys something. A gym I work out with, work out in, there's three Navy SEALs that work out there. I, I don't know how many of you guys know what burpees are, but burpees are things like Marines do during boot camp. I mean, it's extreme training. But my trainer had me doing burpees. And after I finish, I do three sets of six. At the end, you jump up in the air. And when I finally finished my last jump up in the air, I went down on my knees. I was so physically exhausted. And I just casually looked over um, that, you know, one guy was walking by me, and he was a Navy SEAL. I've never talked to him before in my life. The, our eyes made contact, and he gave me a – he just looked at me, and I didn't say anything to him because I, I couldn't talk. I was so exhausted. He just gave me this little Hawaiian, like, you're kicking ass, dude, and just because those Navy SEAL guys kicked ass. I, you can't believe, guys, how good that made me feel, that he looked at me. And I'm, I'm sure I'm at least twice that guy's age. Twice that guy's age. He's looking at me going, that's badass stuff, dude. I'm impressed. And he gave me the little high sign like, good for you, man. He said, you're one of the guys. And isn't that interesting that, that, that all of a sudden you get to that level where you got Navy SEAL guys looking at you going, hey, that's hard stuff, man. <laughs> that's what Navy SEALs do. That's, that's why they're, they're probably, you know, one of the, one of the foremost fighting groups. Uh, groups in the United States. I mean, you don't want, and interestingly, they're, they're quiet guys. They're on, they aren't over there gabbing all the time like I like to do, you know, unless I have a trainer with me. They're quiet, but you know, they're just, they're all strong. They're all tatted up too. I mean, you just look at them, and if you didn't even know he was Navy SEAL, you'd go, no, I, that's not a guy I want to mess with. Because <laughs> he has that quiet confidence, they're all strong. 
super strong. And you, and, and you can just see that if they grabbed you, um, they'd kill you for sure. So anyway, that's my latest highlight. The, a Navy SEAL would happen to glance over at me and, and look at me, didn't smile or anything, just gave me the little Hawaiian, Hawaiian sign like, hey, that's, hey, that's good shit, man. <laughs> that's the kind of stuff these guys do. Bob, how can people find out more about your book and newsletter? They can, they can go to my website, realestatetiming.com, just like it sounds. You can sign up for my newsletter or you can, or you can buy my book, Timing the Real Estate Market. Um, it shows the five key indicators that I use and how to use them to time real estate markets. And you can even do that in whatever major, major city um, that you can um, – uh, that you choose to use those indicators on, as long as it's a city, you have to have a sample size of over a million people. So could you use them in Toronto? Of course. Toronto, I mean, Vancouver? Of course. Could you use them in Pukis, you know, up near the North Pole and where the Eskimos live? No, you could not. You, you couldn't use them there. And so and before I sign off, guys, the last thing I'd like to tell you about is, is, is because the, is about health. Health isn't Diets and doing things based on motivation, that's not going to work because motivation will wear off. It has to be a lifestyle change, guys. You, do, you, you know, like here in the United States, we have Weight Watchers with Oprah Winfrey. Now, they advertise, they spend tons of money every day you see them on TV. Do you think if that crap worked, they'd have to advertise on TV like that? No, because it doesn't work. So that's why they have to keep advertising over and over. So it has to be a lifestyle change. And even if you start small, go to the gym. Us guys have to lift weights as you get older. There's, you have to. If, if you're, if, if you're going to look strong and look young and have muscles like a young man, you have to lift weights. And you just have to get into, into the habit of doing that over the course of a lifetime. And then the benefits, I, I know of no other investment that pays higher dividends, guys. So it's that important. You know, having money is important. I love having money. It's not like I need money to be happy, but I love being comfortable financially. You know, that's really, really important to me. Where, 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 you know, nobody, you know, nobody can tell me you have to do this. No, I don't have to do this. You need to go to a job to pay your mortgage. No, I don't need to do that. I've got enough money to do that. But the, the, the best way to, that above and beyond that, the best way to, way to be comfortable financially is to be healthy because it's good for your brain, too. Super good for your brain. I can't believe it. I just turned 75. My memory is as good today, maybe even better, than it was 20 years ago. You know, people get only, oh, I'm having a senior moment. I can't remember, you know, what day yesterday was uh, or, or, you know, what, what I ate for breakfast. That's not the case with me. It isn't. And, and the only thing I can attribute that to is that it's, it's health. You stay physically strong, so you stay mentally strong, and now you lead a good life. And now if you know how to buy, buy real estate, buy low and sell high, you got it made, guys. And I do. So I'm happy with, with life. Bob, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you, Jim. Bye. My guest has been Robert Campbell, publisher of the realestatetiming.com newsletter. He was speaking to us from San Diego. Coming up, John Rubino, next on This Week in Money. Introducing Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY on the OTCQB, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit Recyclico.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble. He founded the website DollarCollapse.com. He's speaking to us from near Port Angeles in Washington State. Welcome back to This Week in Money, John. Hey, John. John, the Fed is hinting at a slowdown in rate increases. Are current rates high enough to slow inflation? Yeah. Um, you, you know, actually, the, the Fed um, kind of took the whole um, slowdown in rate increases thing back uh, during their Q&A. 
Um, and now they, um, you know, they, they seem to be implying that they're going to keep raising rates for a really long time. But uh, to answer the second part of your question, I would say rates are already high enough yeah. to slow the economy down. We're seeing many, many signs of an incipient um, recession right now. House prices are tanking. Um, car prices have rolled over and are going back down. Um, hiring, you know, if you look at the, especially the tech sector, layoffs everywhere. Um, and um, most industrial commodity prices have peaked kind of in June, more or less, of this year, and they're rolling back down, too. And, you know, some of them are down for the year. So they, there is zero inflation in those commodities. So I think you add all that up, and uh, it's highly likely that we are heading into a recession of some sort, either you know very deep and very sharp, or else kind of grinding and you know slow moving. Either one um, in the coming year, and uh, that I think by you know, for sure by the end of 2023, um, rates will be coming back down, uh, which will just you know put us on the same cycle that we're on of bigger and bigger booms and busts, um, assuming that it works. So the big question will be next year. Um, can the Fed do the things they've done in the past where they engineer a, um, a bursting bubble and then start reflating the next bubble right away with extremely low interest rates and extremely fast money creation? Or is, is that whole thing over? You know, Has this bout of inflation um, made it likely that nobody's ever going to trust the Fed or the, the rest of the central banks again? Uh, and all the pressure of policy mistakes fall on currencies. And I, I think it's highly uh, possible, if not likely, that that's the story of next year. What does it imply going forward if we have commodity prices coming down, uh, especially lithium? Well... Now, is lithium a whole different story? <laughs> yeah, you know, lithium was part of the electric car market. And um, what a lot of the governments of the world are trying to do is accelerate the move towards electric cars uh, without us having assured supplies of a lot of the materials that are required to do something like that. Uh, so that's a, um, it's probably a special case. You know, a lot of industrial commodities, like I said, are falling in, in price because uh, they, they got ahead of themselves. They got too high. And demand is slowing in a lot of the industries that use those industrial commodities. But uh, with, um, for instance, California and places like that and, and big parts of Europe saying, okay, we're going to have 50% electric cars on the road in this fairly short time frame, and then we're just going to get rid of internal combustion engines and make everything electric um, thereafter. Um, you know, it's not clear where we get the cobalt and the lithium and even the copper to do that. So... Those industrial commodities um, are less dependent on market forces and more dependent on political decisions. And right now, the politics is all pointing towards massive increase in demand for them. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of really interesting plays out there that sound kind of inflationary because, you know, this thing's price is going to go through the roof. Uh, but in most cases, it's because of political decisions that are being made uh, that are pushing... Um, uh, you know, a certain agenda that leads to certain demand for certain um, components and materials. And I think the electric car market is a perfect example of that. You know, anything that we need to go in electric cars is going to be in big demand for the next half century if these plans play out as, as currently designed. Where is this electricity going to come from to power all these cars? California had rolling blackouts over the summer, and people were told to park their electric cars because they didn't have the electricity to power them up. And they only, what, account for 1%, 2% of the vehicles on the road? Well, <laughs> you know, first of all, you can't really use California as, a, as an example of anything because they're just, uh, you know, as dumb as most of the leadership is in the U.S., California's leadership... Um, that's a new standard for stupidity and self-contradiction. And you just um, pointed to one of the perfect examples of that. They, you know, they screwed up their um, power system so completely that they're having blackouts, and in some cases planned blackouts, this year. Uh, at the same time, that they're, they're basically forcing people to shift to electric cars, but they don't have the electricity generating capacity to charge the cars that they're insisting that people buy. So now they're telling people... Don't charge your cars. Yeah, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Um, 
but um, yeah, it's, it's not clear where we get the electricity to go fully electric with the auto fleet in the world because, um, you know, we could have done it with fossil fuels, but there are problems with fossil fuels that make that politically impossible, which takes us to another interesting um, investment play that is partially about public policy, and that's uranium, because um, a lot of countries now are realizing that their, their power grids are almost are messed up almost beyond redemption, uh, and they're changing the plans that they had in place to mothball all their nuclear plants or to stop building new plants in, uh, in that space. And they're, they're going in the other direction where they're, um, they're reopening nuclear plants that exist now and they're um, phasing in a build-out of new nuclear power plants. Uh, and here again, um, we don't have anything like the, uh, the amount of uranium coming out of today's mines that it would take to run the now likely number of nuclear plants for 10 years hence, which means that the, the price of uranium has to go up enough to encourage a bunch of new mines to open. In other words, um, you've got some uranium in the ground, but it's not really cost-effective to get it at today's prices. Uh, if prices double, maybe you go get it then. And that's kind of what has to happen. So uranium, is, you know, there's a, there's a really interesting set of investment plays out there. Um, as I'm sketching them out, and uranium is one of the most interesting. So um, the fact that uh, stocks are kind of choppy in a lot of big sectors that we thought we could count on are tanking, um, is that, that's all happening, but there's a lot of other things that look really interesting right now, and uh, the ones we just talked about are, are near the top of that list. Uh, a UN report uh, claims that uh, half our glaciers will be gone by 2050. Where is the hydropower going to come from if we don't have melting ice? Yeah, well, we're seeing a lot of hydropower be impaired by rivers shrinking. And, you know, a lot of that is um, us diverting rivers before they get to the dams, you know, to, to for instance, um, you know, supply water to Las Vegas or um, irrigate farms in the deserts of um, the Imperial Valley in California. You know, those are things where water doesn't normally belong and it doesn't flow naturally. So we're diverting rivers, um, and that's making dams less productive in terms of generating electricity. And, you know, in, in the U.S., we've got a couple of lakes, Lake Mead and Lake Powell in the southwest, um, that used to be immense. And they're shrinking at shocking rates. And, and one more year, like the last couple of years, and uh, the water level in those two lakes will go below the, uh, the water pipe level where the, the water is taken and, and, uh, and sent to its many uses out there. So they'll just have to tell the farmers, I'm sorry, <laughs> there's literally no water for you. You know, good luck farming that desert from now on. Um, and it's made that way around the world. And, and uh, you know, I, I've been seeing charts lately that show um, ice packs in certain places not melting nearly as fast as um, the model said they would. But, uh, but again, that's a longer argument about whether uh, global warming is, is real and whether it's progressing at the pace that it's uh, supposed to progress and what that means for ice sheets and snow melt and glaciers. Um, longer story. But it's, it's an absolute fact that rivers are drying up um, and lakes are shrinking. And, um, you know, I don't know how it is in Canada. My sense is that you guys have much more fresh water available than we do in parts of the U.S. But I think huge sections of the U.S. are just going to become unlivable pretty soon, certainly unfarmable. Uh, and it's not clear what we do about it. Yeah, I think a third of the world's fresh water is in Canada. But uh, that's all wrapped up mostly in ice and snow up north. So uh, if that's yeah. not there, well, then there goes the fresh water as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, just you know, be, be careful when you talk about how much fresh water you have. Yeah. You never know if the U.S. is going to try to invade you and take it. Because, uh, you know, since we're invading everybody else in the world, why not go for the fresh water? Uh, if you look at who owns what in Canada, I think the U.S. is already successfully invaded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, economic imperialism instead of yeah. military. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's our that's our preferred way of doing it, but we'll resort to blowing up everything in sight if we have to. 
Capital is flowing out of high-tech stocks and into energy. Why? Uh, well, a couple of reasons. One is that um, big tech has been ridiculously overvalued for at least the last five or six years. But uh, money was flowing into them because, they see, in every cycle, a certain group of stocks capture the imagination of the public and analysts say, oh, you can buy these at any price because they're always going up. You know, that mindset takes hold for that group of stocks. And, they, you know, we have the nifty 50 back in the 1970s and tech stocks in the 1990s and housing stocks in the 2000s, same thing, and they all crashed. Now, now it's time for big tech to go back to their intrinsic values, which is maybe one-third as high as their peak values. Um, now that money that's flowing out of them has to go somewhere, and it's, it's now flowing into energy, largely, um, because uh, as we talked about, all of a sudden people are realizing that the, uh, the world's power grids are a nightmare of mismanagement and stupidity, and we've got to fix it somehow. And, uh, you know, in large part, it means we've got to go back to fossil fuels, at least in the short run which means ExxonMobil, which they kicked out of the, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average a while ago. You know, they, they replaced Exxon with Workforce.com in the, uh, the biggest, the stock market average that includes the biggest, most powerful industrial company. And since that time, Exxon has tripled and Workforce.com has dropped by like 50%. <laughs> so they, that was uh, when they look back on um, milestones in this bubble. Um, kicking Exxon out of the Dow Jones Industrial Average is going to be one of those milestones, you know, where, okay, that was peak stupidity, um, and, and the end was near when that happened. So, Anyhow, a, a lot more money now is flowing into energy companies. So the uranium stocks are getting a bid, and oil and gas are getting very serious bids right now, and even coal, which was a dead industry five years ago, um, is now um, populated by some hot growth stock. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you know, you can't make this stuff up, Jim. But, uh, you know, the, the wages of stupidity are just amazing, especially in the U.S., but also in lots of other places. Yeah, in Europe, uh, they're ripping down wind farms so that they can expand their coal fields. I know, yeah. And they're, uh, they're cutting down ancient forests in order to heat their houses this winter. Yeah, it's, it's shocking how, how fast that changed. You know, I think uh, to the extent that um, carbon output matters to the uh, environment, um, we are, we are going to lose 10 years of progress on that front in this year probably just because of, uh, you know, all the new coal we're going to burn, all the new oil we're going to pump, and, and the forests we're going to burn down. It's really amazing. Yeah, I saw a documentary. There's something like 3 billion humans who still burn things like animal dung to cook their meals, and that's highly polluting. And they're trying to develop a stove that can burn scrap wood and dung efficiently and not pollute so much, because most of that pollution ends up in their homes and in their lungs. Well, well yeah. In, yeah. In, in countries where people um, do their heating and cooking by burning stuff inside, indoor air pollution is a horrendous problem. Um, as well as the environmental pollutants that flow from that. Um, but, you know, there's only so much you can do when there's 6 billion too many people in the world. Um, so, you know, we're, we're I guess, just going to have to accept that, uh, you know, the, uh, the degradation of the environment and the horrendous human suffering that we see around us right now are going to go on for quite a while until... Um, you know, the current technologies are revolutionized in terms of efficiency, and falling birth rates start the population on a, a, a steady decline that continues for a few centuries. You know, you know, otherwise, this is a mess. You know, there's no way to get around it. There's no way to fix the world's problems in the short run. Mortgage rates are nearly 7% in the U.S. Is that high enough to break the housing sector? It is indeed, you know, uh, we, we didn't know what the numbers would be because there was, there was always this debate about, all right, what's the Fed funds number? What's the yield on the 10-year Treasury bond? What's the yield on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage? What, what rates will break their markets when those things happen? I think we're pretty much there, you know, a, a 7% mortgage. Think about this. Um, 
if you bought a half a million dollar house, $500,000 house with a, uh, a 2.5% mortgage two years ago, and I buy a half a million dollar house now with a 7% mortgage, I'm paying twice as much per month as you paid or you're currently paying on your 2.5% mortgage, um, which means that house, effectively, I'm paying twice as much. I bought a house that's twice as expensive, um, but it's no bigger than the one you're in. It's no nicer than the one you're in. It's just that houses got that much more expensive. Uh, and houses were already unaffordable for the average person two years ago, even with 2.5% 30-year fixed rate mortgages. Uh, so now the number of people in the U.S. Who, who can buy the average house has shrunk to a minuscule fraction of the population, uh, which means that house prices have to come down dramatically um, to, um, to make houses affordable again, uh, which means that the people who put their life savings into their house are going to see their life savings shrink by half, let's say, which means <laughs> uh, that... Uh, People are going to feel poor and stupid because of their real estate decisions a year from now. They're going to spend less money. In other words, we'll have the, the wealth effect shift into reverse, and that'll slow the economy down dramatically. So, yeah, I, I think um, housing is a big part of the 2023 recession story. Uh, and all we have to do to track that is just um, look at housing starts and look at existing home sales. I think you're going to see both of those numbers crater pretty soon. Will Airbnb landlords have to dump their houses? And if so, how will that affect the broader housing market? Yeah, that's another brick in the wall for the, the housing industry because uh, basically in the last couple of years, um, lots of people have bought rental houses that they were going to Airbnb. And they were, they were basing their um, buy decisions on very unrealistic revenue projections. And it's turning out that uh, the typical Airbnb is making a lot less money than people thought it was going to, which means a lot of these guys can't cover their mortgages, which means they've got to dump their Airbnb house on the market at some point because they can't afford to keep it going. Uh, and that's just a lot more inventory that's going to hit the market pretty soon, um, which will force prices down. So you get this kind of death spiral where uh, the further down it goes, the more people have to sell. But the more people that have to sell, the further down prices go. Um, until you get to some rock bottom low place where uh, anybody with capital automatically buys houses just on principle because they're so cheap. We're nowhere near that. You know, the one, the one upside of all this is that uh, these real estate douchebags, or, or I'm sorry, Wall Street guys, <laughs> the, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the um, private equity guys who've been out there buying houses and buying up, in some cases, entire neighborhoods at above market rates because they knew they would be able to raise rates and squeeze their tenants for every last penny that they've got and make a profit. Those guys are seeing the value of those houses they overpaid for um, drop somewhat lately, but on a trajectory to drop by 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 percent, depending on the market. Uh, and, you know, maybe we'll see some private equity bankruptcies pretty soon, which would be possibly the only bright spot. In, uh, in this kind of a nightmarish market that we've got. Well, uh, some people have said it takes 12 years to come back from a housing crash. Well, you look at 2008, uh, 18, that's 10 years. 2020, 12 years, that's the peak. And then a little bit on top of that, and now the correction. And how long will this uh, housing correction last? Well, see, the thing is, We've built up so much debt over the past 40 years that there's going to come a crash that we can't recover from. And it's totally possible that this is the crash um, because there's so much leverage out there that when the economy turns down this time, uh, we're going to see all kinds of over-leveraged entities just blow up. I mean, we've got pension funds out there that have uh, have been investing borrowed money to try to keep up with the 7.5% target return that they can't possibly meet doing conservative investing. And we've got hedge funds all over the place that are loaded up on derivatives, and big banks that are loaded up on derivatives, and, and uh, people who bought the most house possible that uh, now can't cover their mortgage payments. It, it just goes on and on. Uh, once they start blowing up, it's, it's 
completely unclear at this point how a government or a central bank can step in and save them because the, the amounts needed would be, let, let's say it takes $15 trillion to bail out all the, um, um, the, the potential bankruptcies in the U.S. in the next couple of years. But creating $15 trillion new dollars out of thin air on the part of the Fed will crater the value of the dollar, which will spike inflation, which will cause a new wave of bankruptcy. You know, we've got um, a very real possibility of that kind of a death spiral um, in the, uh, the not-too-distant future. And there's no coming back from that. There's no fix. So this, you know, eventually the uh, fiat currency, fractional reserve banking, unlimited government spending system is going to break and just collapse, and it will have to be replaced by um, um, something. You know, we'll see. That's a different debate. But um, this might be the time, you know, because the numbers are just so gargantuan that, uh, that, that it would be shocking if we were able to pull another 2008, 2009 quantitative easing kind of thing and, and dig ourselves out of this hole. You know, it's much more likely that everything just falls apart. And what does that mean for the average person? Should should we be uh, buying gold, silver, something that has had value over the last 5,000 years? We should absolutely be buying gold and silver. When these fiat currencies fail, um, capital will pour out of them and into real things, and gold and silver will be among the, the prime beneficiaries. Uh, you, you, know, you should be prepping in every way beyond that, too, like um, have a garden, um, make sure that you've um, integrated yourself in your community so completely that lots of people have your back in case of an emergency. Make yourself um, indispensable at your job. Don't just show up, do your eight hours, and go home. Make sure your boss knows that you're willing to take on anything that they need, and your goal is to make them happy. You'll be the last one laid off if that happens. You know, do all of that stuff. But um, financially, gold and silver are a really good place to start. And, you know, we're seeing it today. You know, you're watching Precious Metal. This is, this is Friday, uh, Friday the 4th. And let me make sure silver is still up before I say this. But, uh, yeah, silver is up $1.43 an ounce in, uh, in U.S. dollars, and gold is up $50 an ounce. So it could be that the market is starting to figure out all of the stuff we've been talking about. And, uh, and it's starting to... Um, anticipate a Fed capitulation, in other words, anticipate central banks switching gears and going back to easing, and then further anticipating that it won't work and that these fiat currencies are doomed. You know? that, when that happens, the early trading will look a lot like today. So we'll see if this continues, but um, you know, the people who bought gold and silver lately are pretty happy, I would think. The strong U.S. dollar, will that change when the Fed finally pivots on its interest rate charge? Well, remember, the, um, the U.S. dollar can be measured in two ways. One is versus the other crappy, mismanaged, soon-to-be zeroed-out fiat currencies of the world. And that's, you know, when you say strong dollar, that's what that means, that the dollar is up versus these other currencies. The other way is to look at purchasing power. In other words, what can you buy with the dollar? And by that standard, the dollar is incredibly weak. It's down by 10% this year or more. Um, in other words, inflation was uh, at least 10% in terms of what most people buy. Um, so the dollar is tanking. Um, but if we're talking about the dollar versus other currencies, um, who knows? Um, because the U.S. is seen as relatively safe, and I think in general, North America, let's, let's include Canada and Mexico in that. This is just a, um, it's a safer place to be in a crazy world. So if there's trouble in Europe or Russia or China, even if we're the cause of the trouble, and, you know, if the U.S. is causing the trouble out there, they still want to buy dollars because they perceive dollars and uh, U.S. government bonds as relatively safe because we've got these oceans insulating us from uh, the trouble in the rest of the world. So it could be that the dollar stay strong relative to the euro and the British pound, but it still plunges in value, just not as fast as those other currencies. And I, I think that's the, the more likely intermediate-term scenario is that all these currencies just start to evaporate um, at varying speeds. And, uh, you know, under one scenario, the dollar falls more slowly, so it looks strong relative to other currencies, but they're all crap. You know, they are all headed for their intrinsic value, which is zero. Uh, they'll just get there 
uh, in slightly different years in the future. Anything else that we should be keeping a, a close eye on right now? Geopolitics. Mm. The world is uh, on the verge of World War III, uh, and it's mostly the fault of the U.S. and NATO. We're out there picking fights with everybody in the world right now. And the guys in charge, and I'm not including Biden in this, because he, he's clearly somebody they just roll out, put in front of a camera, and then, and then put him back in a box somewhere. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, the guys who are running the deep state in the U.S. clearly, for some reason, want a world war. And it could be that that will distract the voters from their own mismanagement. It could be that they're just bloodthirsty psychopaths. I have no idea. Or it could be it's like Dr. Strangelove, where they've already got their bunker, their underground impermeable bunker, um, stocked with 18-year-old girls that they can use to repopulate the earth after. You know, it could be one of those things. Who knows? But um, for some reason, they want that fight, and that terrifies me. I have two sons who um, are of an age that could be sucked into this, and the idea of my kids being vaporized in a um, nuclear war is just um, its unthinkable, and yet we're, we're close to that. So, uh, and obviously, that's one of the other things we should be paying attention to. John, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Sure thing, Jim. Thanks. My guest has been John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble. He founded the website DollarCollapse.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Robert Campbell, and John Rubino. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen.